Hey guys, here we are with the Quiggin Out MMA podcast, episode nine, and I have the honor and privilege of being joined not just by my co-host Nick Ramirez, but by the one and only Bert Watson. How you doing, Bert? Man, I'm trying to make it, baby. I'm, I'm, I'm actually quigging out. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> the man, the man's on the show for ten seconds and steals my tagline. <laughs> Oh Lord, uh, Nick, that? How about that? <laughs> yeah, hey, that's good. Oh man, okay, I stop. I yeah, stop. I listen, stop. man, I I love it. I do. I stop. I stop. And, you, you guys, you guys caught me on quarantine. I've been, I've actually legitimately been in the house sixty days. Oh so, man. You, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I, uh, I pay attention to things. Yes. You no, know, and I've 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 been through some things, and I know how real things are. You know, and I'm going back, back beyond Vietnam. You know, and spending some time in the in the Marine Corps. You know, hey, thank oh, you, love and appreciate yeah, your yeah, service. Absolutely. Oh yeah, Semper, Semper Fi, you. man. So you know, I know the realization of things, and you know, people from my era. You know, no disrespect to you, young guys. No, but no. We okay. we take we we take things a little more to heart and to ear than 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 the fear of, of me being invincible and it can't happen to me. So I've, you know, when I've had no reason to go out, I don't, it's, 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 it's a little tough right now because, man, I mean, our, MM, our MMA world and, and boxing, you know, it's struggling, man, because yeah. there are no events mm -hmm. and there is nothing on the books at a regional level or anything yeah. until – you know, October, November, uh, you know, at, at, at the, the higher level, uh, you know, UFC and Bellator and PFL, when you have major network sponsors or sponsors, you can afford to do a show without fans. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because you got that TV money. But yeah. anything <laughs> other than that, a regional guy, you, you know, your money is in the stands. Yep. You know, uh, putting putting booties in the seats, and I'm gonna pretend this is a family show, so I'm not gonna use the word I want to use. But putting <laughs> you can, booties, you can use whatever you know, words you want. Putting, I will never put, censor you. Putting asses in that seat, baby. That's what that's what it's all about. So so they it's 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 not easy, or or they can't do a show without fans because then they don't make any money. Uh, even though. Fortunately, MMA, something like MMA and boxing, you know, and maybe even, you know, when you get to an individual sport, it's not hard to condense your television screen to the action that's going on right there, mm -hmm. yep. you know, and, and not, yep. not pull it out. So they're fortunate in that sense. But, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been trying, and, and I, I know the schedules, and I see people's schedules, and, there's nothing on the books, man, until yeah. October, November. Yep, that's true. And that's what's so tough is that, you know, and I have to do this because he asked me to. So Mitchell Tamale was on the show earlier this week. <laughs> and I've known Mitchell for years. And, you know, when, you know, he put on that show and MMA fighting, I can never take credit for this because pandemic promoting was what they called it. And I know uh -huh. he lost okay. a ton of his own money to do that yeah. just to say, I was wow. here, you know, these guys, yeah. I told yeah, them they did. were fighting. I told them I was going to get them paid. Let's do it. And even though he won't take credit for it, I think he paved the way for the UFC to use Jacksonville for the first time coming back because I look back, and I don't know if you can remember all 510 events, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, Well... Five hundred and ten events? Is that what it I, I is that up to now is that up to now? Yeah. Wow. And how okay. many times have they okay. been to Jacksonville before that? Well, you know, <laughs> and, and let me and let me let me tell you, uh when they first the first show that they did in Florida was not you know, it wasn't a rousing success in terms of mm -mm. the people and the fans. So at that point, it was they were trying to find spots to go back to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Florida was not one of them. It, we were, and, it wasn't marketable. Yep. No, not at all. And 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 I uh, I know, you know, is it is it Tim? I know Tim and Patrick Cunningham, Tim Shipman. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Patrick Cunningham up in the Florida Commission. Yeah. You know, those guys are good to work with. And they stuck with Mitchell. And, you know, they worked mm -hmm. it through. You mm -hmm. know, even though I can, I can tell you, I'm a coordinator, man. I do that for a living. <laughs> and, and I know the lefts, the rights, the in the middles, the in the betweens, the up, the, the downs, you know, every financial aspect of it that some people have no idea is there, mm -mm. you know. So I know the cost that went into putting something like that on, especially with the cost of testing. And, and I know the testing that needs to be done because as quiet as it it's kept, I, I did some coordinating from somebody at a distance. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, I mean, guys get tested. You know, you're talking about, I don't know what, what it may cost right now, but, you know, two weeks ago or so, you were talking about $250 per guy, True. you know, to be tested. And, and that was... That's not a little bit of money in the scheme of things when you don't have a television deal. So my hat's off the Mitchell to continue and go on with that, you know, but you know, when you're when you do when you do promoting and you're the type of person that he is. Because I've I've seen promoters dog people. <laughs> Trust me. And I'm and I'm and I'm saying and I'm saying that without fear. <laughs> okay. okay, you know it was, and, and let me know when I'm over talking you, baby. It was. No, this is it's this it's is probably crazy. the main reason that I got into coordinating because I did a fight in California, and I'm gonna be respectful and not mention names. Okay. And back then, at the time, fighters, well, I mean promoters' names, names of the promoters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fighters. Yeah. Fighters were getting between fifty dollars to a hundred dollars a round to fight. Okay, Jeez. and that's <laughs> and that, was, that was everybody. Wow! If you got a four round fight, you got four hundred dollars. Period, and that included per diem and anything else. You just got four hundred. Wow! And I did a fight with somebody in California, and actually, it was I had. Joe, Joe Frazier had, between his sons and his nephews, he had seven guys fighting at the same time. Wow. To include Marvis Frazier. Yes. To include Joe Jr., <laughs> yes. Mark, Tyrone Frazier, who fought the guy from South Dakota, I forgot his name, Virgil Hill. Okay. Uh, Anthony, Rodney Frazier, and, and, and Mark. But there was about six or seven of them fighting at a time. So we started doing promotions in Philadelphia. And we had to move around, you yep. know. And, and because he was Joe Frazier, <laughs> you know, it wasn't hard to get guys nope. on other parts. So, <laughs> so we moved two or three guys to a fight in uh, California. And because I was there, they used me to help me <laughs> coordinate. And I, you know, and I did. And... We had this one kid, and he was, the kid was, was a Mexican kid, but he lived up in the hills of California. And I, don't, I don't remember exactly where. Okay. But he took a four-round fight at the last minute, and the kid came down there. He fought that four-round fight, and he fought his ass off. <laughs> he lost the fight, but he gave them a full four rounds. Yep. At the end of the night, when that kid went to get his money, the promoter took two hundred seventy dollars out for his medicals, oh. and 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 took a forty dollar out that was paid for the the two night hotel. Something had to do with the hotel stuff. That's Dude, insane. So that poor that poor kid had a hundred and twenty dollars or something like that. Wow. For, for, and he just looked. He didn't have enough money. He said to get home. And to make it through the next couple of days. Damn. So I, I ran my hand in my pocket. And I think at the time I had about $150. And I said, I ain't going to give it all to you. But I'll, <laughs> I'll give you some of it. So I gave him the 100 I kept the 50 Yep. But I made it. And I swore that night 
that I will I would never ever let another promoter take advantage of a fighter. That's all. Awesome. And That's I incredible. said, you know what? From this point on, and I say to all the fighters, I can f with you, but I'm not gonna let anybody else f with you. Mm -hmm. That means commission promoters, house people, housekeeping people, venue people. I can do it. I'm not gonna let anybody else do it. But I made I made a vow that night to never let it happen to a fighter again. And guess what? I've I've done the best that I could to do to do to make it happen. Not on my watch. I've always had it's always the fighters first for me. Always. Nice. Nice. And it's always it's always been that way. Yeah. I can do it, I won't let anybody else do it. And I can I can I can be a little a little tough. On some things, you know. <laughs> you know? Not, not you, not you. <laughs> well, well, hey, hey, I'm also, I'm also, a, I'm, a, I'm a dad, and and I'm also a hood rat from Philly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's a lot of things that 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 I know, you know, when guys start to get to going, and I'm like, you know what? Hold up, bro. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna work with you, but you can't work against me. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because then I gotta pull two plows, yeah. and I'm only gonna pull one. <laughs> so you gotta get on here and work with me. And I say that to everybody, one way or another. I will never disrespect you, but you know I'm not gonna let you disrespect me. So I, I, you know, I took that vow, and and always, always got a had a good relationship and and. Learn how to work with people. But I learned that in life from my mom, period. You know, uh, uh, but, but, you know, I learned between that and the Marine Corps and everything else, I learned how to work with people, how to work with a group together. And, and I never had, a, never had a problem with fighters or, or mm -hmm. anybody, you know. I won't say getting out of line because they got out of line a lot of times. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That fight is for you, man. They did some shit. That if... <laughs> <laughs> but but overall, you know, just respect for me and the system and 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 the sport that they did. Because I, man, a professional athlete to get to that level and boxing yeah. and MMA, man, it takes a lot to yeah. get. That level. Well, I'm gonna let you guys ask questions now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was wonderful. That was no offense uh, to anybody else that's been on the show, but that was the best 12 minutes of the show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, oh, but it's like yeah, you've man, been doing was, this before. <laughs> that's, but, but that's you know what? It's easy. It's it's easy when it's true and you know it, and you did it. And see, today with social media, you can't lie about nothing. Nope. Nope. Because they can Google everything. Yep. <laughs> you just, all you got to do is put what color underwear does, and you know what? Boom! <laughs> it comes up. You can Google anything you want, and I'm, I'm and you know yeah. I'm technically challenged, but I know that you can, man. So yeah, true. you got to be you got to be truthful with it, and I am, and it comes from here. Absolutely. And. And I just want to touch on it because you've said so much that I'm literally still trying to process everything you just went through. But you mentioned something I did want to Give talk about. Give me back about. my $100. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'm, I'm done. Go ahead. <laughs> Wherever you are in this world, if you got that 100 send it back. <laughs> uh, so go ahead. I'm sorry, man. Go ahead, baby. <laughs> Oh, man. No, you talked about being a hood rat from Philly. So I wanted to see, yes. like, where did Burt Watson come from? Like, what was it like growing up? And how did you, you know, like you said, obviously there's a, a lot of respect for mom. And then oh, ending up in the Marine Corps. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, uh, you know, well, my my father is from Jamaica, Partial, partially from Jamaica, and my mother from Charleston, South Carolina. Gotcha. But they grew up in the South, yep. and I grew up basically in the South. I mean, we moved to Philadelphia in 1957 or something like that. 
Uh, but uh, I came from the South to Philadelphia and spent most of my, all of my life, because I went through high school and, you know, stuff like that in Philadelphia. And my mom was, she was not a single mom, but you would have thought she was because she ran everybody. <laughs> she ran dad, she ran us, you know, but, 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 you know, she ran it and I watched it. Because I, I, everything she put out, it, it turned out later in life. But I went through high school in Philadelphia, and it came time to go to college. And she tried to get get me into a couple of the, you know, the the, the Division One schools in Philly, uh, and gotcha. you know, yeah. some other things, yeah. and and that didn't happen. But then this little school out in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. <laughs> Sent my, sent my mother a letter and said, yes. And she came to me and said, we packing. Yeah. Yeah. And she wasn't talking about a gun. <laughs> no. So, so, and I'm talking about 19, I'm talking about in 1967. Wow. Uh, uh, and now, some, now somebody's sitting there with a calculator trying to figure out how old I am. <laughs> but, but I ended up, I ended up, in, in a small school in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, Hiram Scott College, that I went to school. I did three, three, did about three years. Uh, and going into my third year, back then, they had the, uh, oh, I forgot what they called it. But the draft system mm -hmm. was oh, still yeah. there. They could still draft you. But yeah. just when they were quitting the draft, they came up with a numerical system that they threw your number in a hat and whatever number you got, that's how you went in. Wow. And I got a, I got a two, uh, one Y or something like that, but they could pull you out of college or wherever and pull you in the end. So they did that. Oh. I got a draft notice that I was going in the army. Yep. And yep. when we were on break in the quarter, I went home and I went home and I'm, I'm sitting and I've never told, I've never said this one before. But I went home because I was, I had the draft notice, and I know I had to go. And my mom's thing was, well, you got to do what you got to do. So I'm sitting there. My mom was a nurse. She came home with a book, and it was an Ebony magazine. And I'm looking through Ebony magazine, and there was a brother in a Marine Corps uniform with a white hat doing this. Wow. I said, Shit. Yeah. <laughs> I says, I'm going to look like that. Exactly. Okay. I'm going to look like, true story. <laughs> I th and I saw, I saw that on, on, on a, a Friday night, Monday or Tuesday, I was in the, the Marine Corps recruit depot. I was in the, in the office enlisted wow. in the Marine Corps. Wow. And I did. Wow. And I enlisted in the Marine Corps. And when, when, when that 2S deferment or, or whatever that was came back, they somehow with that social security they knew that I was somewhere in their system. Yeah. So they left me they left me alone. So I ended up joining joining the Marine Corps, man. Nice. You nice. know, and that was during the Vietnam area and era and I uh uh communications was my uh MOS, you know. You got that's it. What they call, that's what they called it. That was my MOS. And I carried a radio, a prick twenty five. Uh, yeah, man, yeah, and they called it a prick twenty-five. Yeah, right. But, <laughs> but you know, I did communications, you know, and 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 spent most of my time between. I was all out of country, you know, between going there and Okinawa and coming back, and then didn't want to do any stateside duty because I was salty. When you came back from over there, came to Okinawa, you didn't want to come back to the states. So, I. I did uh, a couple of cruises. I did a med. I did a couple of med cruises, you know, and that's through from Florida through the, the Straits, yep. you know, the rock past the Rock of Gibraltar, and I, you know, I went to Turkey, Greece, oh, wow. uh, Barcelona, Spain, Naples, Italy. And when you got wow. up to Naples, you turn around. And I did that. I did that, and then I did the the, the, other the, the, car, the yeah. Yeah. So I was I by the time I got to be by the time I was twenty five I had been around the world. 
Man, who could say that? Yeah, yeah right. And, 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 yeah, but I had a uniform on and couldn't hardly remember none of it. But I did it. <laughs> okay. okay, okay. I knew what it was. I knew what it was to go to Greece and not drink uzu. You yep. know, I knew what it was to go to Barcelona and get get caught in the Canary Islands where you shouldn't have been. You know? <laughs> uh, I think I think uh, when I was in Turkey, which I won't say too much about this, but no, the first okay. time I first time I I ever saw a debtor's prison. Wow. And mm. do you guys know what that is? Uh, and, and that's that's where, where if the man of the house owed the government or owed whoever, uh, they put them in there for the the amount of time to pay off that debt. Right, but they right. didn't put they didn't put him in there. Oh, they put the wife. Bingo. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, know, I, was I, like, know. I was like, whoa. <laughs> That's you know, crazy. But, but I saw all of that and saw the world, you know, by the time I got out of the Marine Corps, I had been between bouncing around to different duty stations in the States, you know, Camp Lejeune, Camp Pendleton, wow. NCRD in California, and, you know, 29 stumps, Yep. you know, and then doing all the other stuff. By the time I got out, I had been, I had been around the world, baby. You know, wow. and it was like, whoa. So that that kind of, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I actually, believe it or not, started in high fashion. Okay. I went, I went to, I went to a school for fashion designing. I learned That's to do pattern, I learned to do pattern making. I was the only guy, probably now in MMA, that knows how to hand tie a bow tie. <laughs> 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 uh, and and make his make his socks match his match the clothes he's got on. But I, I I did that and kind of ran around and eventually ran into Joe Joe Frazier. And I'm cutting it, condensing it. Boom! There you go. Ran, in, ran into Joe Frazier, which kind of we you know there was a car accident one day and he was standing there and I saw him and knew who he was and you know just figured I'd go speak and I spoke and he spoke and. That friendship wasn't a friendship, but it was a connection. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then later on, my uh, niece got married in Philadelphia. Now, the history of Joe Frazier, my niece got married. And as a present, one of my mom's friends gave her a limousine service for her wedding. Ooh. Nice. The history, the history of Joe Frazier that Joe Frazier owned the limousine service. <laughs> she had a story. She had a stories coming together. Yeah, two, two stories on Google. So, <laughs> so, so I don't know if that's on Google or not. But so my 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 niece had the wedding, and I'm I'm in it, you know. And we're sitting there, and my nephew comes in the house, and he says, Uncle Bert, uh, there's a car out there, the limo, and and the guys want you to know he's out there. And I said, Well, you know, you need to go tell him he needs to park because we're gonna be a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So he went on to tell the guy, he came and he said, Uncle Bert, you know what? That guy out there looked like Joe Frazier. So I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I went outside and it was this white limo with tinted windows. Back then, you could really have tinted windows. Yeah, you mind. could black them out. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The day they black them out for you. Oh, yeah. But I went down, I knocked on the window, and he rolled the window down, and there he was. Uh -huh. Joe oh. Frazier. Joe Fra Joe Frazier. I'm like, whoa. He was like, whoa. <laughs> you know? And the thing thing is, he owned the limousine service, and Joe was a tinkerer. He would tinker with anything. He would take this computer apart and wouldn't know how to put it back together, but he would take it apart. Okay, and 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 he did that with a lot of things. Yeah. And that was his personality. So back in the day, they were using clipboards where. They had the driver had his name on the clipboard on the board. Joe came in, saw the job, but there was no name on it. Mm -hmm. So that meant the driver didn't take it. Joe got the limo and he drove it. Oh man! He came, what a, showed what a the story. <laughs> and, the, and the rest is history. Yeah, shoot. From that point on, Joe Frazier and I never separated. That's awesome. And uh, uh, you know, and I, I, you know, I stayed with him on through. His last fight was against Jumbo Cummings. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was Joe Frazier's last fight. 
And after that, my job was to create situations off of his name. I well, got you. I didn't have a hard time with a name like Joe Frazier. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who, so who's Joe was, Frazier? Was, I don't. I don't know. I, <laughs> that was. It was. It was probably almost one of the easiest things I ever had to do. You know, and oh. it was. I mean, the people that I got to meet during my time with Joe Frazier, yeah, and the people that I would go into a place with Joe Frazier. And Madonna, well, first of all, Mickey Rourke. Oh wow! Uh, would do this, like you know. <laughs> Don't hit that me. Shock, that shocked me. That <laughs> that person was like, whoa, whoa, they're smoking Joe, smoking yep. Joe. And I mean, from Queen Elizabeth, uh, wow, Liz That's Taylor, crazy. Richard Burton, I, the people that he was friends with, you know, Clint Eastwood. Uh, uh, I, I got to meet, and I know you didn't ask me this question, but it, it's a part of it anyway, but I got to meet one-on-one -on -one with Nelson Mandela. Oh, and that's awesome. Oh, we'll God. never, Nelson, Man, Nelson Mandela was a boxing fan, a true boxing fan. Absolutely. And when, he, when he got out of prison, his first wish was to meet Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali. Yep. <laughs> or maybe he said Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. Hey, but that was what right. he wanted. That was what he wanted, and we got the phone call. And I'm still yeah. getting used to. It. I'm like, is somebody on this phone telling me that that Nelson Mandela is calling here and saying I want to meet? And that's who it was. Wow. But it wasn't Mandela. It was his people. Wow. So we went on to New York at the United Nations. Went downstairs in the basement. When we got there. You know, when Joe Frazier gets someplace, the red carpet comes out. The red carpet went downstairs under <laughs> under the United Nations. We went in a room, oh, sitting in a room. And Joe had to go out out of the room for something because I told you Joe was a tinker. I don't know why the hell he left the room, but he did. <laughs> and about five minutes later, Nelson Mandela walked in the room. Wow. I, I that, That's what I said. I was like, yeah. oh. And his guy came in behind him, but... He walked in, and man. So we, you know, met him, and Joe actually gave him the championship belt, the one that he won March 8, 1971. Oh, nice. Uh, he gave him that belt, you know. So, And that, that kind of went on from there and turned into me becoming a coordinator and working in boxing and, yep. you know, doing boxing events. And I did – Boxing events for everybody. The only person I never met was Lennox Lewis. Okay. And that's, that's the only person I never met. I did Tyson's last six fights. Wow. Uh, I did Sugar Ray Leonard, Roberto Duran, Marvin Hagler. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, Camacho. Yeah, Macho Camacho. <laughs> George Foreman, Larry Holmes, Ken North. Anybody. That was in that. Yep. Period. Wow. Because I also worked with Don King. Gotcha. And, and Cedric Kushner and Lou Duva. Yes. Because of Joe, because of Joe Frazier. So, you know, and Open. Open I, did, I think it was Gaddy, Arturo Gaddy and Dale yes. Hoya yes. or somebody. I was doing a show in Vegas and the guy that brought me in came to me and said, hey, man, we're uh, – this guy called me and he's starting this organization and he's looking for some good people. <laughs> he gotta put some, he want to put some people together, you know? And I, I didn't know who, who he was talking about and really didn't care. And I just, <laughs> my motto was, you pay me and respect me, you got me. Yep. Plain and simple. And he <laughs> said, well, the, guy, the guy's going to come up here in between the weigh-in and the fight. Because the weigh-in was one day, the fight was the next day. But I really didn't have a lot of time. So he came up about six or something, and we went to have a quick bite, and the guy was Dana White. Oh, my God. He was thin. He had hair. He didn't have a, full, <laughs> a, full, a full head of hair, but he had hair. Yeah. And he was like, hey, man, I'm, I'm putting this thing together, and 
he was a promoter because at the time he was promoting and, and managing, I think, Chuck Liddell and Tito, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. But one way or another. And I said to him, I said, listen, man, you pay me and respect me, you got me. Plain and simple. Absolutely. And he said, well, you know what? I'm going to have something the first of the year. And this was in October and November of 1999, I think. Uh, don't quote me on those years. Yeah, yeah. Hey, that's, because that's then, what Google's for, right? <laughs> yeah. He came back in 2000 and said, listen, man, I got an event coming up in February or whatever. And boom, yeah. That was it. UFC 30. That was my first one. Oh, wow. Wow. Jeez. What Question. Yes. What was, did you, what was the, did you ever, like, watch Fraser when he, uh, practiced or trained or whatever and and if you did what was the craziest thing you seen him do naturally well you know what uh uh when i first met joe he had a group of people around him that wouldn't let me get near him okay <laughs> okay that wouldn't let a lot of people get near him but joe was 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 a friend and he liked me so when they pushed me away he pulled me in eventually gotcha. I ended up getting pulled in where we got rid of all them people. There you go. Uh, but, but, but I think that I think the craziest thing that I when I say crazy, Joe had an unbelievable love of the sport and unbelievable conditioning. Yes. Unbelie unbelievable. Oh yes. When I say unbelievable, I've seen Joe hit a heavy bag and leave a dent in it. Damn. <laughs> See, and see, back then, heavy bags were heavy mm -hmm. yes. and had no sand cushion. or something in them, no cushion. Nope. And I saw him with that left hook yeah. hitting, hitting that one and because of the accuracy of the punch and hit that bag and leave a dent in it. Damn. And I was convinced, you know, that, man. Yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> You know, he, he was, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was definitely, definitely, regardless of what he did or how much hanging out, because he also loved to hang out. Of course. You know, you got to be him too. But he, <laughs> stayed, he stayed on course and stayed in shape, man. And, you know, there was a one, there was a time there that he got a little weak, but we all saw that fight, yeah. you know, with George. You know, I think George yeah. put him down six times or something like that, but. Overall, man, he was unbelievable. Absolutely. So, well, and I was, that's, looking at you, his, just looking at the record, record, like. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> would you think that that type of defense that he have in that bob and weave, when you first saw that, were you just like, what is this? <laughs> well, you know, no, and no. I'll tell you why, because I'm from Philly, <laughs> okay, and everybody from Philly could fight. Very true. Everybody Very true. from Philly knew how to do this. Yes. Everybody from Philly knew how to do this. Even in the streets. You know, guys took their shirts off and did a little street fighting. And that's when you just hit to the, what's called body punching. You yep. didn't hit to the face. It was just to the body. So everybody was quick with their hands and slick with their style. Gotcha. So I never knew anything different. And Joe Frazier was, was right in there, but he was relentless with his. Instead, oh, of bob, instead of total bobbing and weaving, his was like this. Yep. He came. He came. Instead of bobbing and weaving and going back and sliding like off. Like 90 it, degrees. Right. 90 degrees come back up. 90 degrees right. come. I don't right. know how he did. Right. right. He he chugged forward. He chugged forward. He chugged yes. forward. And you yes. know, I'll tell you something. He had a little thing where sometimes they would throw water on him in training. Oh, uh, okay. Would get, he would get close enough to somebody. And he would hit him. And he and he said, when I hit him, you know, when you hit somebody, they grunt. Yes. <clears throat> if you hit him hard enough. And he said he would hit him hard enough so they would breathe on him and he would knew he would know where they were. Oh man. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't have to he didn't have to look up and look for him. That's awesome. Because <laughs> when he hit him, <clears throat> He knew right where they were because he could feel it. <laughs> wow. 
he can, he, he can, but you know what? Think about it. Put it in yeah. your head. And think about hitting somebody, somebody breathing on you. If you're, if you're sweating, you can oh, feel it. Yeah. So he said he didn't have to look up. No. Nah. Because he knew right where they, right where they were. Because he would Man. throw it. He would throw it if it connected. They told him right where he was. And yeah, I got you. Woo, woo. <laughs> That's insane. That's dope. That is dope. <laughs> I don't even know how to follow that. <laughs> like, uh, but like you said, it's something so simple as being able to hear it, you know, but hitting somebody yeah. hard enough where they breathe on you and you can mm -hmm. feel it. Yeah, well, well, you know what? If, if, you, if, you, if you trained for that Second. and you, 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 you looked for that, you, you knew it and, 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 and you conditioned. You know, it's like when I transitioned from boxing to MMA and I would see guys training in MMA mm -hmm. and when we would go to a hotel, <laughs> you, know, you know, in the hotels and, and in a ballroom, yep. they had, they, they would close the, uh, what do you call them? Like Whatever the, the walls were. Yeah. Yeah. And they would close them for the room. But the guys were trained up against that damn thing like they were on a, against a cage. Jeez. And this was MMA. And I mean, you, I'm talking about, you know, anybody from Rampage to Chuck, you yeah. know, you know, to whoever, you know, was, was on that wall training. And, 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 and I think, I think that, 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 Randy or somebody did a little more than Chuck because Chuck's thing was knocking you out, so he didn't need to get you up against the wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He wanted you right in an armory like Joe, where he could just tag you. But the guys used to train, and, and, and I never knew why the hell we uh, y'all all up against that wall. You got to stay off that damn wall. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was times I'd come in there, and the damn wall was off track. <laughs> and the hotel people came to me and say, uh, Mr. Burke, uh, we got a problem. And they would take me in the room and I'd see the wall look like it was coming down. Oh, my oh God. They had, they had separated the wall from the top because, you know, when they roll around on the mat, they'd roll around for a while and they'd get up and go stand against the wall and the guy would run into them against the wall and they were up against that wall for 15 <laughs> good minutes, man. But that was, their, that was their training and that was how they worked out. And, and and it was to assimilate being up against a cage. Yeah. And I didn't really understand that until, you know, getting in to MMA, but that was, you know, that was my transition. And man, that was, that was something to see because <laughs> I had no idea about MMA or, or, or Muay Thai or grappling, Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. Yeah. I knew none of that. You know, and I always tell this. I always tell the story. I say, I knew Bruce Lee and Bruce Leroy. That's, <laughs> that's about as much as I knew. Who's but the then man? I, yeah, uh oh, you must have watched it. Yeah, oh, <laughs> Who the man? Heck yeah. You know, so when I got to MMA and I would see these guys grappling, and and see how strong they were, and you know. Being a guy from boxing in Philly, you know, if I put my hands on you, it was because I couldn't fight. Okay? If I yep. grabbed you to wrestle you, I couldn't fight. Yep. So I had to wrestle you. So I see these guys grabbing, and I'm, and I'm like, man, they must can't fight. In my head. <laughs> in my head. But, man. But then again, you know, I came into MMA when they was just starting. And when them guys got off that ground and they started to do the stand up, man, they were they were doing like this. There was no they was like cat fighting. I'm like, man, that ain't boxing. But <laughs> I didn't know that stand up was not necessarily a part of MMA and grappling. I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, yeah. But then those guys were developing their skills. Yes. And those guys went from this to this. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Real quick. Real yep. quick, man. And I saw <laughs> I saw them develop. I saw the, 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 the technical skill levels 
develop. I saw them go from just wrestling to, 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 to wrestling and stand up and, and really hitting and, 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 and striking and blocking punches and yeah. blocking punches and then shooting and grabbing somebody and throwing them down for a leg bar or something, you know? And, so I I saw that development and it was it was a thing it was it was something to see man and Heck you know yeah. what I think for your your first event being UFC 30 cuz you know yeah. Google is my friend right now cuz I don't remember all of them you watched <laughs> the fight between Evan Tanner and Tito Ortiz that had to wow. be like oh my god coming from boxing yeah, well well you know what it was and I think I saw more blood on that card that night oh, yeah. than I saw my entire career in boxing. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, because also, I mean, we had, and, and, and one thing was that, that, that when I saw Tito and Evan Tanner and, and I saw how those guys, you know, I mean, that, that shit was intense, man. And, 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 you know, Tito was, was probably better at striking and his little skills and his techniques. Yeah. Was a little, Evan Tanner was tough. Mm -hmm. He was. Absolutely. Evan Tanner was, you know, hit me, I'm going to make you hit me again. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, it didn't matter. He was, he, it was like that one round, was it Bisbing and, and, and Stan, Brian Stan, was it? Was it? Was it? Yeah, yeah. Went, I mean, it just stood there. Back. Yep. I'm like, holy S H I T. <laughs> you know? But but yeah, that 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 was unbelievable, you know. And I think B J Penn, between thirty or thirty one, I think I also saw B J Penn make his pro debut in one of them. Randy Couture was oh, in yeah. one of them. Uh, but yeah, I did. B J Penn fought on the prelim card. Of UFC 31. Is that, is that what it was? But you also yeah, had yeah. a main card with Couture, Carlos Newton, Chuck Liddell, Kevin Randleman, Pat Militich, Pedro Hizzo. Gee. God, Pat oh, Militich, my man, my man, Pedro Hizzo, and and, and Rock. actually, Rock, Pedro Hizzo. <laughs> and you, you know, you know what was what was really surprising to me, coming from boxing, and I told you I'm a hood rat, but I'm a hood rat, <laughs> I'm a hood rat with an education. Hey, that's good. <laughs> and, 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 and coming from boxing, most of the guys in boxing came from the street. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And very few, if I had 10 boxers, maybe one or two of them eventually right. went to college. There was no, yeah. there was no college. And yeah. when I came to MMA, all of those guys that were grapplers grappled in college and came yeah. from college. Carlos Newton was, was going was going to go to medical school. Yeah. And I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> he was gonna he was gonna go to medical school. So the transition from guys that were straight out of high school to guys that were all in college and just kicking the S out of each other, man. Yeah, sure. It was it was it was definitely but to get started in a sport with those guys and 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 they were all not all of them like BJ was his first and you know was his pro de his pro debut one of them cars Phil Baroni I think Mr Badass the yes, Badass either, <laughs> yeah we're on or supposed to be on but everybody that was there wanted to be in the UFC yes wanted to be with that organization so they all came to me with their eyes this big. Mm -hmm. Very regardless, true. regardless of who they were, man, I saw the newness in those guys, you know, that eventually are now legends, but, but yeah. every one of them, man, came on. And I mean, we did 30 and 31 back to back in Atlantic city. I think, I think we were in Atlantic city. Uh, and we did that and it was, it was funny. I'll tell you a quick story. <laughs> running out of time here. No, but go for it. You're good. We were in. Uh, uh, I think it was. I think it was. I think it was thirty. I'm in. Uh, in in the hotel in the lobby, 
and the bar was right across from the from the registration desk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but I met everybody. I always made a habit. I did this with everybody. Every fighter that checked in, everybody that checked in, the first voice they heard and the last voice they heard was Bert Watson. <laughs> From the time they got there till the time they leave. And it, when it was time to roll, baby, and time to get yep. in that cage, they heard that good and loud. Good. You know, that we roll and trust me, baby. Yes. So I'm in the lobby of the hotel, and there was... Kevin Randleman, Mark Coleman, and I think Phil Baroni or somebody. Jeez. And there was one other guy. And there was this guy who was a fan, but he was telling them that this stuff wasn't real. <laughs> <laughs> Last time he said that ever. <laughs> <laughs> and they were may, not may having it. Rest in now, peace. <laughs> now, now, they were not going to, because I was there. I was standing there and kind of back and forth, but I heard the commotion going on. <laughs> but I, the, the bottom line was they ended up getting into it with this guy verbally, and the guy, he, they chased the guy, and the guy ran into the bathroom, and they chased him in there. And he got, the guy ran into the bathroom and locked himself into the bathroom stall. <laughs> so, well, that didn't save him. Nope. <laughs> Because I got a, I got the hotel people coming to me the next day with a bill for I think it was seventy one hundred dollars or something crazy where they had ripped the stall. I knew it. Off. <laughs> <laughs> so him running in the hotel, running in the bathroom. Now it may have been seven thousand or six thousand, but it was close in that number. Hey, that's a lot of money. And that's because them guys ripped that bathroom stall out of there, but. I personally, man, never had a problem with none of them guys, man. Kevin Randleman, that was my man. That was my man. Evan Tanner, that was my man. That was my man. Mark Coleman, I think I'm a little older than Mark Coleman, but that was my man. Okay? You know, Phil Baroni, still my man. Yeah. You know, never had, you know, any kind of problem. BJ Penn, still my man. You know, it, it was like I said to them, I'm not going to let anybody else, I'll do it, but I won't let anybody else do it. But you're going to have to, you know, if I'm going to pull this plow, you're going to have to get on it because we both <laughs> can't pull it together. Yeah. But, you know, it was always, always a lot of fun, man, and nothing but genuine love and respect from everybody, man. Well, everybody. I mean, you dealt with thousands of fighters over 14 years. Uh huh. And I, I mean, how you like kept that energy all the time? Because there was never a time I ever saw you on TV where you were at fifty percent or seventy five percent. You were always at one hundred and ten every single time. Absolutely. And those fighters, you know, I feel like over the the last you know six years or so, I know everybody talks about your departure story, and I'm not here to talk about that because you've told that story so many times. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel and like still that's... people are saying, still people are, uh, uh, when I see articles when people say, when the UFC let you and Stitch go, man, they let the heart go. And the UFC didn't let me go. I left. No, I ran yeah, my mouth. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I let somebody say you something said, to me. said, I was disrespected. I didn't like how I was told totally. to me. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And I was gone. And that was, yep. that was your thing from day one. You said, you respect yes, and pay me. We're good. You 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 Absolutely. you respect me and pay me. You good. You you got me. You know. And you know I was uh, and I just did this and counted, but I've never really said a lot. And I said it the other day. I was talking to to a Glover to share. Mm -hmm. Oh okay. And 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 this was uh, a week ago, week and a half ago. Oh, before his fight or something. Uh, this was just after, after his. Yeah, just after. Oh, okay. right after. Right after. Cause I do a little. Think sometimes now I get on the phone with one of the legends guy and I do a legend to legend, so it's kind got of got you. Cool thing. Well, I'm, and it's I mean um, it's fitting for the show. You are a legend, but yeah. <laughs> well, well, Vito Belfer was the one that started that stuff. So, but that's how it kind of <laughs> kind of worked out. But I figured it out that from around 1985 to today. My record is 356 and 0. Ha <laughs> ha, nice. 
I've done 356 fights. Wow. Never had, never lost one guy. And within that 356 fights, I have walked from the dress room to the caves 6,408 times. Oh my God. Woo! <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, wow. I, and, and this is the second time I've ever said that because I, I, I always kept, I always kept a total of 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 the fights of how many fights I did, but that 356 was only if you averaged that that each card had nine fights on it. Yeah, didn't include and the fights in my done, I've done, yeah, but I'm saying I've done very few cards with only nine fights on it. Yeah. Especially in MMA. Most of them are 12 and 13. In Absolutely. boxing, they're usually 10, 12. So that, that, that figure was an average of if you had nine fights. Oh, so you I just done more than 10. 6,408 times I walked to that cage. Now, I wasn't always yelling, we rolling. Yeah. Uh. You know, at the beginning, I was, I, at the beginning, I wasn't. But then after I got tired and kept running back and forth and my feet swole up and my knees started hurting, I said, you know what? I am not, because I used to, I'm, I am perpetual motion. Yes. Just like, go, go, just go, like go, right go, now, go, go. I am perpetual motion, in and out of the dress rooms, in and out of the dress rooms. <laughs> and I would do that. And, and I would do that. And at the end of the night, for two days, I struggled because I was my feet and legs and all that. And finally I said, you know what? I am not running up and down that hallway no more. <laughs> I, am, I am not running in and out of them dress rooms no more. <laughs> so I started yelling. I would run up and down the hall. We got one hour. We yeah, got five more to go, baby. We got a dirty 30 before we roll in that hole. We got five, five before we go live. And I would say that loud enough, and when it was time, I would say, it's time to go to work. It's time to go to work. And you know what that means when it's time to go to work? And I would hit it. We rolling, yeah, <laughs> all night long. Awesome. And I did that. And the thing is, being from Philly, singing a little doo-wop, I knew that when you got in the basement or something, it echoed. Yep. So I would stand in the middle of the hall and that shit resonated. <laughs> and from that point on, it was no more walking out and in the death. That's how We Rolling came up. And I, That's dope. There, there was time I would do that. And I, I did it one time of walking, and there was a, a guy walking into the room with, a, with, with, with some ice in a bucket. And I said, yo! We, <laughs> he dropped the bucket in the ice, but I wasn't talking to him. <laughs> Yo, we got five more to go, baby. One hour. Scared him to death, man. But you know what? And and I, I don't know how my voice stayed the way it has over doing that for the 14 years. Mm -mm. That, but, that's not normal. <laughs> Yeah, but you know what? It, it it came from here, and I still got it, and I'm still rolling, and I'm still holding on, baby. Heck and yeah. I'm a I'm gonna hold on till I can't roll no more. You got it. <laughs> and to keep you in your time parameters, there's no better way to end it. Um, that was amazing. Like just playing it simple. Yeah, just... absolutely. Well, I I remember you saying you you're a Western buff. Before we go, favorite Western film. Yeah. Favorite Western film? Let's say top uh, three if you can't say a favorite. Uh, I I liked all of the good, bad, and ugly. I okay. I like I like I like those, but you know what? I liked Silverado. Nice. Uh, okay. I did I did like Silverado? My personal but, favorite, mm -hmm. uh, Tombstone. Even though. It wasn't a traditional Western. You know what? Tombstone would probably go up in my top three. Okay. Silverado, yeah. Silverado and Tombstone, I did watch all the way through. Because, yeah, I'm yes. your Huckleberry. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. You brought no, down yeah. the thunder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You got me. You got, and that's, that's, that's the best movie. Oh, who was the lead in, in, in Tombstone? Kurt Russell. Uh, Kurt Russell. 
Yes. Kurt Russell. That was the best yeah. movie I think Kurt Russell ever did. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. 100%. In my opinion. And Val yeah. Kilmer. Okay. Oh, yeah. Val Kilmer. That, that, was the, with Doc that was the best that they ever did. And then, yep. you know, yep. so. But but right now, you know, Gunsmoke, Half Gun Will Travel, Rawhide, yeah. Wagon Train, Lone yeah. Ranger. I still get that stuff on my television and I watch it right. religiously. Those are good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, man. Well, yeah. that was awesome. Well, from Matt Quiggins, Combat Press, Quiggin' Out MMA, Nick Ramirez, the one and only Burt Rotson. You going to roll us out, Burt? Bert? I can't even stop. Hey, it. man. Got, you you going to make me do that? Are you really going to make me do that? You going to make me tell you that it's time to go to work? And when it's time to go to work, you know what that means, baby. We roll out! Yeah! Oh, <laughs> yeah! Oh. Thank Boom. you, Burt. I'm done.